Nicolas Torreta is an artist and researcher from Brazil that lives in Malmö today. Good for us. Um, Nicolas works on design in the intersection of music, design and arts, focusing in particular on decolonial and plur pluriversal approaches. Nicolas is also a musician and a luth Luthier. Luthier, yeah. Luthier, thank you. Luthier, which means he builds instruments. He has a PhD in design from Umea University and is engaged in different improvisational and collaborative practices such as capoeira. So let's welcome Nicolas to talk about power and music. Thanks. Can I use this? Yeah. And I guess you can hear me well, because I hear myself super loud here. So. Um, yeah, thanks a lot for inviting me and for this opportunity. And I'm very sorry to say that I'm not going to start with this like music and the power of music. Like This is going to be on the very depressive side of okay, the power structures connected to music. Uh, dun, 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 didn't work. I pressed both sides and it didn't go anywhere. Okay, I used the laptop instead. Yeah, okay. So uh, what I wanna share a bit today is on the intersection of music and society, right? Uh, of course, music has power. It's a powerful uh, tool that we have, um, but music is also interconnected with power structures. And the reason why I, I want to share this as like an invitation is that we could, and I think it's a valuable exercise for us to stop thinking so much about what we do or how we do music and even where we do, uh, and start thinking about why we do music. Why is it music important? Why is gathering around the music important? And what is the role of that in society? Uh, so I'm going to focus on this intersection of like socio-political power structures and uh, music. Um, so we can say that uh, in terms of, like roughly speaking, socio-political power structures, we have people with power, uh, we have people with less power, uh, and we have all of these kind of labels that have been created also to, to talk about different power uh, positions. So we have places called the periphery, the third world, or the underdeveloped, right? Uh, I come from a, a place that has been labeled all of this tree. Uh, and we can see the same in music also. We have a mainstream music with big companies that uh, lead a lot of how the, the music industry is developing, but we also have a lot of weird labels for music, like word music. Isn't every music made here from the word? Or do we have moon music also, or Martian music? I don't know. Pop music should mean popular music, right? Folk music should be music by the people. And isn't pop, folk, word, isn't like, you know? Uh, all of these are very contradictory labors, la uh, labels that show that there is something that is the norm and something that is alternative, something that is something else, right? Um, and we are always positioned in these um, structures. And whether we like it or not, we may say that we are not responsible for creating these uh, power structures, but we still have a responsibility. We have responsibility if we want to keep them existing or if we want to do something uh, for changing them. And what we usually say uh, in decolonial theory is that if you are not part of changing it, you are part of sustaining it. So there is no, no neutral way out. Like I'm not gonna care, and it's gonna, I'm gonna be neutral. No, you are either helping or you are helping sustain it. Right. Um, and these positions that we have uh, in the power structure give us power, privilege, and uh, access to different things. Right. Um, and this is what I've been working with, this intersection of music, design, uh, specifically then like participatory design and, and the design of musical instruments as well. 
and their relation with power structures. Um, I'm gonna throw a word here that maybe many of you heard about, which is called pluriversality, and that's the perspective that we try to work today. Uh, it comes from the colonial theory, and what it says is that we should try to build a world where many words fit. And this uh, is the motto from, for example, the Zapatista movement in Mexico. Um, so a pluriverse would mean that there is no mainstream, there is no one ruling direction, there is the norm, the powerful and the periphery, but that's every way of being in the world, we can think of like every music style, should have its legitimacy to stand and to be um, in a kind of equal ground. And then the important, so that doesn't become segregation, is the communication and exchange between these different worlds. Right? Um, so basically what the pluriverse is asking is to change these power structures and to allow all the other uh, existing expressions to raise and to be all in this kind of uh, playing level. This is super roughly, super fast, super messy into a lot of these big words. Uh, there is a little bit more on this in the chapter that I wrote, and there is some invitations to follow, so some research projects, uh, and basically trying to open a lot of messy doors that you can then go in and lose yourself there. Uh, the thing is that the musical expressions have been very active in, in fighting power structures, right? There are thousands of examples. I'm going to share two examples that I am part of, that I've been involved in. Um, and that's also because I don't feel comfortable to put up another example that is, that is not part of my body, of my embodied experience in this world. So there are two examples from Brazil. And I leave these examples also as an invitation for you to reflect, okay, what is, what types of musical expressions are part of my embodied experience of fighting power structures? What is it that we have locally here in Malmo or wherever you live, right? So a first example, and let's see, the video is always, yeah, it works, yeah. The first example is called Capoeira. Capoeira is a Afro-Indigenous Brazilian martial art that was developed during the colonial times. Um, so the enslaved people, and there was a lot of indigenous and also African people who were enslaved and taken to Brazil, they started developing this fight not to win because they were the weakest in the society against the whole colonial structure, but to be able to escape into the forest and start a new society, a new community uh, that is free. Of course, the colonizers didn't like the idea of uh, the people practicing a martial art, so they mixed it with music. And when the, the colonizers would look, they would pretend that they are just dancing, and it was in this pretending to be dancing that they could disguise movements to take the other people down and escape. And since there was a lot of indigenous people enslaved also, they knew very well how the whole area looked like, or the forests, everything. So they were running away to this forest to start communities that are called quilombolas, which are free communities. Capoeira was forbidden. Everybody uh, found with an instrument in their hands would be arrested. It was forbidden to the point that the Portuguese colonial administration forbid to use the word capoeira in any uh, police record so that after it being erased, nobody could discover that something like that existed before. Well, it resists and it exists and it's now in almost every country. It is here in Malmo. It is pretty much everywhere. It was uh, legalized in Brazil in the 60s only, so that's like more than 400 years of prohibition. And nowadays it is the main venue of sharing Brazilian Portuguese language uh, and also bringing another other Brazilian uh, music expressions together with it. Um, yeah, this is a little bit of how it looks like. 
but I invite if you want to try, there is training almost every day here in Malmo, you know, and everywhere you go, you're going to find a uh, capoeira group. Another example, um, you've probably heard about an instrument. Raise your hand if you've heard about the violin. Have you heard about the fiddle? What is the difference? None. Any other ideas of what is the difference between a violin and a fiddle? Huh? What do you play on? The technique? Timber? Uh, what is the difference in technique, for example? Do you have any? Nice. Nice. So uh, the other example is an instrument called habeca, which is the Brazilian fiddle. And it's, you know, we have many examples here in Sweden also, of the, from nickel harpa to other types of fiddle and, and violas and so on. And, well, it's kind of sad to talk about it just by talking how it is not a violin, but it's exactly about the technique uh, that it kind of differentiates and also the way it's built. Uh, actually, the word habeca in Portuguese was used for the violin before there was this European convention of what is a violin, right? So uh, after this kind of idea of the violin started spreading around, we started using, in Portuguese, also violin for the violin. And Habeca was everything that is like folkish, made in weird ways, and so on. Now what is interesting is that the violin is a universal instrument, right? If you go to Japan, if you go to Brazil, if you go to a music store here in Malmo, you are gonna buy a violin and it's gonna look exactly the same. If you are a violinist, you are able to play it. You are able to go to the symphony orchestra in Tokyo, and as a violinist, you should be able to play with every orchestra in every violin, everywhere. And there is conventions of how it should be built, how you should hold it, what kind of sounds it has to make, what's the tuning. Uh, so it is a universalized instrument. Let's try to be the same everywhere. The habeca is the opposite. There is no convention on how to tune it. There is no convention of the size it should have, of how you hold it, how it sounds. Uh, for example, in Brazil, whenever we say Habeca, we say the name of where it came from. So there is Habeca Caixara, which is from the region I'm from. Uh, there is Habeca Caipira. There is a lot of different Habecas, and it always connects to a specific place. And if you play a Habeca, and you play a Habeca, we probably cannot play each other's Habeca because the, the tuning may be different, the scale may be different, it may be completely different. Right, so it is an instrument that, as we like to say it, it's defined by not subscribing to any definition. You can find Habeca made of wood, you can find Habeca made of oil cans, made of fruits. The goal is to make the music. Right, um, there is more about that also in, in, the, in the chapter. Uh, I hope this is just a little tasters here and there, but uh, I want to invite you also to follow a project that tries to create this kind of pluriversal conversation between music that has been forbidden. Capoeira is going to be part of it, Habeca also. Uh, it's called the Forbidden Music Project, and at Malmo University, funded by uh, Kerforska Stiftelsen, starts in June-ish, and the idea is that we're going to bring people who make instruments and who are part of these expressions from other places um, that have music that has been forbidden and see how can we create new music and new instruments in a way that doesn't create like a smoothie yeah. and is more like a fruit salad. Mm. Um, so that when we are getting together, we don't lose everybody's expression and becomes this universalized mess, uh, but that actually strengthens the different expressions. So how can music that has been forbidden 
and their instruments come together and create things that strengthen these expressions. I don't know how, but we are going to try. Um, it's probably going to be on Malmo University website also. Uh, you can follow uh, on a very outdated uh, Instagram account where I put the instruments that I build. It's my guitars. Um, and that's it. I hope this was a bit opening for, for exploring more on yourselves. Thank you. Thank you.